kind of um, innocuous, but these things would happen several times a day and it was very disorienting. And she said, I really needed it to stop so I could get on with my life. So that was, um, that was, her, that was her experience. When I'm thinking, when I talk about spiritualism, and I am simply thinking that there is a knowing, or there's so much beyond what we know in our minds that I don't think any particular one religion or any, um, any one book or any explanation can explain what it is that, that I experienced and what is out there. And so I just believe that there is a greater knowing and greater knowledge, and um, I feel more comfortable in places like the Unitarian Church that accepts many belief systems, um, but yet I don't even really need the Unitarian Church either. I don't think that, I mean, wherever there is love, wherever, wherever there is light, I think that that's important. I've been to a Catholic church with my grandmother and thought this one particular priest was just filled with the light, and I thought, oh, how beautiful. I'm a Catholic, and when I come here, but I think he's a good person. And you know, I've been to various churches and, and I've been to temples in, in Korea. I thought, oh, well, this particular monk is very spiritual, very connected. And so I think that same light is in that monk that's in the priest. And so some churches are light filled and beautiful, and others are really not all that light filled and not, not that great of an experience. And so um, to me, churches are just. Um, Places to experience the light, but you can also experience it in, in meditation. So now we come to distressing experiences. And um, unlike the predominant emotions of pleasurable NDEs, those of distressing NDEs include terror, horror, despair, isolation, things like that. And there appear to be four types of distressing near-death experiences. And I'll walk you through um, the, the four types. Um, most often, people s report the exact same kinds of contents as pleasurable NDEs. They're out of their body, but they don't want to be out of their body. They're moving rapidly through a tunnel, but they don't want to be. It's like they've got their heels dug in, you know. So, um, um, there's some speculation that, that this may happen if the person has trouble letting go, if they uh, tend to want to stay in control or they're, for whatever reason, resisting the experience, then it becomes um, unpleasant. But, um, it's n but there have been cases where the person was started out this way and then at some point they decided to just let it go, let it happen, and then it turned pleasurable. So there's some indication that it really has to do with their resistance or um, desire to control. Net, a little less often, uh, people will, or actually much less often, people will describe an experience of absolute um, isolation in a place of eternal void. So uh, an example is a guy who grew up in a very abusive home. And his way of coping was to withdraw emotionally. So he just didn't let himself show, so he didn't make himself vulnerable to um, abuse as much as possible. And he carried that mode of operation into his life, school and um, friends and, and all that. He was very um, w held back. And um, around the age of 30, he had a, near, a medical crisis and a near-death experience. And his experience consisted entirely of becoming conscious and being out in an absolute, eternal void, totally alone, forever. He, it was an, an experience of absolute isolation and disconnection from everything. And in that experience, he knew what it was to be really left alone. So he you know, was resuscitated, and in uh, looking back on the experience, and I heard him talk about five years later, he said that he had realized that um, for him, 
he believed that that was the experience he needed in order to per continue in his psycho-spiritual development because his whole goal in life up to that time was to be left alone. And only in that experience did he realize what it would be like to really get his wish and then realize that that really was not what he wanted. What he wanted was safe connection. So he then proceeded to reprogram himself to learn to, instead of putting all people at one end of the continuum as unsafe, he began to discern that some people are very safe to be open and close with and others are not safe and all in between. And so he learned to find and um, cultivate relationships with people who were safe and really experience safe connection. So it really, um, again, transformed his life, but the experience itself was a distressing one rather than a pleasurable one. Uh, research on distressing experiences is not really extensive, but what has been done has shown that the after effects eventually are the same. In the short run, they're not the same. Um, usually, people come back from distressing experiences being afraid of death, you know, understandably. But eventually, they come to see the experience in a broader context and lose that fear and um, transform in the ways that is typical of pleasurable near-death experiencers. Um, pe a very few people, um, so we're talking about a small percentage of a small percentage, uh, report being in a situation where there's some kind of um, torment. And um, uh, like uh, Matthew Davel, who has been on TV, and I also have interviewed him, um, he in his ex one of his experiences, because he had two near-death experiences, in his second one, uh, which was actually a suicide attempt, and by the way, there is no correlation between pleasurable, distressing, suicide, or other kind of um, near-death circumstances. Um, people who attempt suicide have reported pleasurable experiences, um, but it they. Um, Suicide NDEs might be a little bit more um, distressing, but probably because the person was, again, in a distressed state of mind when they, you know, um, died or almost died. So anyway, in Matthew's case, he, um, he in his first NDE, which happened when he was a, a, like about 11 years old, a drowning accident, um, he met Jesus and Jesus told him he had to go back and he had things to do. And, um, and so he, um, that wasn't a problem, but uh, in, in the aftermath, he was um, profoundly empathic. And if you can remember, like, junior high school or middle school and all the emotions and stuff that go on and all the drama, and there he was plunked back into that, like, being like an open, you know, um, wound almost. Um, it was awful for him. So he began to use drugs, he said, to because that would actually um, like close him down um, emotionally, empathically. So um, anyway, he gets to, into his um, early 20s, got a terrible drug problem, and he believes he's no earthly good to anybody, so he tries to kill himself. Well, he, um, in his NDE, he finds himself falling, free-falling through uh, space. It's very terrifying. And eventually he lands on the surface he said was kind of like t a tennis court clay kind of surface. And the moment he landed, he shattered into seven hymns. There was a hymn that was over here just wailing in um, distress and remorse and helplessness. And then there were two, three sets of two hymns. And two of them were encountering people from his past. He said that a person from his past would appear and come up and kind of bump his chest. And when they did, he would have this um, experience of, of like a little life review where he experienced, re-experienced his interaction with them and experienced being on the receiving end. And he said he had not really been a very nice person for a lot of his life. And a lot of this was distressing. And he said, you'd think it would be, you know, the important people 
people like my wife and um, that sort of thing. But he said no, like one of them was this um, person he had interacted with in for about 40 seconds in a grocery store one day and he'd been really nasty to her and he experienced what it was like to to be on the receiving end of his own actions. So that's, that was two of them was having that experience. Two of them were experiencing um, like uh, things that were happen were going to happen in the near future, like his uh, how it would be for his mother to get the phone call telling her that he had killed himself. And then two of him saw into the future. And at the time that he attempted suicide, he had a, an infant daughter. And he saw her on her um, graduation day from high school, sitting alone in her room crying because once again in her life, an important day and her father wasn't there to share it. And so um, he said this went on for nonstop for what felt like to him in the experience three days and three nights. And then and the him over here that was crying was um, actually crying out to Jesus to save him. And so he said that at one point, it's like the sky sort of opened up and this hand came down and picked him up and when it did all seven of him came together and was drawn out of the scene and then he had an encounter with Jesus again where Jesus again told him you got to go back there's stuff for you to do this time he got the message he now is the CEO of a um, nonprofit to prevent suicide so very again you know this um, becoming more um, concerned about others and uh, that sort of thing. It, it, it happened with this distressing experience just like it does with pleasurable ones. Um, and there is, in all the literature I've ever read, I've heard one, I've read one case where the person felt like judged in a negative way, condemned by spiritual entity. And so um, it's, I, I can't say that it never happens, but you know, one case, and I've probably read and talked to and interviewed thousands of NDEers. Um, so it's just hardly never happens. Um, in 20 studies of distressing near-death experiences, the incidents ranged from 0 to 50%. Um, probably um, the best estimate is maybe 10% of uh, NDEs and um, as I said before research has revealed no clear differences between pleasurable and distressing NDEs. It appears that anyone can have. Uh, one of the things I like to say is that near-death experiences themselves and both whether pleasurable or distressing seem to be an equal opportunity transpersonal experience. Um, we have no way to, to know that one kind of person is more um, likely to have the experience in a close brush with death than another. Um, Near-death experiences of children and teens, um, their uh, NDEs are similar in both contents, after effects, and um, their testimonies can be um, really quite poignant. And I want to read you one case from the handbook. Uh, this is the chapter by Sherry Sutherland. She's an Australian uh, near-death researcher and uh, focused particularly on children. She said, Erin was 10 years old when I first met her, just 12 months after her NDE. At that point, she still, still showed some uh, physical signs of the brain damage she had sustained as a result of a cardiopulmonary arrest during an acute asthma attack. These disabilities included a slight Parkinsonian disorder, limited use of her left hand, and difficulty in walking. Erin had the luminescence I often observed in child end ears, and I found her to be extremely intelligent and highly articulate. According to her father, Erin had been clinically dead for perhaps three minutes, and after a critical period of about five days, she finally came to blind and with no movement at all. It was some months after this episode that Aaron first spoke about her NDE. He said at the time that it was, quote, a humbling experience, unquote, to be given, quote, the most believable description of life after death, unquote, by his daughter, a child of nine years of age. I met with Erin and her parents three times over a six-month period. 
On that last visit, I found the level of her recovery astonishing, and as she and I sat together on her bedroom floor, she was even more full of fun and good humor than usual while drawing what she had seen during her experience. On all three occasions, I found her story to be consistent. And by the way, there's been research about Andy Ears um, telling their experience decades later and um, then analyzing, the comparing their account decades later with their account right after the experience happened, and there is no significant difference. So unlike dreams, which are very prone to being forgotten, and um, even waking experiences, which are very prone to being misremembered, people um, remember their near-death experiences in a very um, um, clear, salient kind of way. In fact, the gal that I had dinner with last night said, as she was talking, she inserted the little phrase, it's like it happened three minutes ago. It's just very fresh in their minds. So here's Erin. When I was in the ambulance, I was looking down at myself and thinking, oh my God, oh my God, what's going on? And then I was on top of the ceiling looking down at myself thinking, oh, this is radical. And then all of a sudden, I saw my mom and dad. They were crying their eyes out. Then something pulled me through the ceiling and I was flying down this cloudy white tunnel. Then I saw this beautiful, magnificent light and I stopped there. It was so nice and peaceful. And then somebody spoke to me and it was a familiar voice. It was Vanessa, one of my best friends who had passed away. She had light all around her and she looked quite pretty. And then I saw God. He was standing in a light. Boy, was he good. God had a body, but he wasn't male or female, and he had like billions and millions and millions and trillions and billions and billions of heads, all of the heads of the whole galaxy. I was searching around to find my head, but my, my head wasn't there. It must pop off when you die. Then God, <laughs> then God gave me three choices, to get reborn or to stay in heaven, or he said I could go back to my body, but my body would be damaged and I would have to fight. I chose to fight. Bad choice. <laughs> I'm full up with all these memories. I saw Jesus too. And whenever you see pictures of him, you get really fed up because that's not what he really looks like. There were millions of people there. There was the reincarnating line. There was the staying line. And I was right there on the fighting line. It was spooky. I've been trying to block it out of my mind. But this is the toughest bit. When I had to fight, the devils had weapons and I didn't. So Sherry said, how did you fight them then? And Sherry says in parentheses, Aaron looked astonished that I could be so ignorant. And Aaron said, with my heart. That's how you fight the devil, with your heart. So that's an example of how touching. Um, one child described um, that at one point in her experience, she, she, this is a, a little girl of uh, three or four, and she said, I went really fast through this big noodle. <laughs> so whereas many adult near-death experiencers need focused assistance in integrating the NDE into their subsequent lives because our culture by and large does not prepare us for the possibility of having experiences like this. And so people are often, there. it's like their worldview is pulled out from under them and they have a lot of rearranging of their, their um, fundamental beliefs to do. Um, even more so for children, that they may really need assistance uh, after having near-death experiences. So um, one of the things that we recommend is uh, for healthcare providers is that when someone recovers uh, or yeah, is, is um, regaining consciousness after loss of consciousness or has been through any kind of um, trying experience to say to them something like, you know, when people have been through something like you've been through, they sometimes uh, report that they had unusual experiences or something that they maybe didn't expect. And if you had anything like that and want to talk about it, I'm, I'm here to talk. So it just opens the door without um, um, ex expressing the expectation because we certainly want to convey that if you've been through a close, if you've survived a close brush with death and you remember nothing, that's normal. And if you remember something, that's normal. Okay, no pressure.
So the characteristics of Western near-death experiencers, um, and this is the part about that they're an equal opportunity experience. Now I'm going to contradict myself um, a little bit in a minute here, but oh, this is a good point too, that NDEers reflect the same mental health status as the population at large. So um, some people will have, um, will, most people are mentally healthy, some people are not, and again, equal opportunity experience. Um, it is, uh, there might be some psychological features that are seen a little bit more often in people who've had near-death experiences, but we don't know whether those features um, existed before the NDE, so we don't know if it was pre-existing or caused by the NDE. So again, we just don't know. Um, to just to hit the main point of this um, chapter, NDEs have been reported across cultures. And um, particularly um, um, in what has been consistent across cultures is that people report otherworldly environments with spiritual entities, deceased loved ones, and spiritual <coughs> figures. And, um, and a social environment that, you know, where there's um, a physical and social environment. Um, and the main point of the chapter about religion is that every scripture, this, or the scripture from every major religion contains language that um, is consonant with near-death experiences. So it suggests, again, some, um, some universality of the experience. And then we come to veridical perception. Um, veridical perception is um, where the person perceives something that is later confirmed to be accurate. And um, there's a particular subset that I call AVP, apparently non-physical veridical perception. And this is where if you consider the person's, um, the position and condition of their physical body and their, what they report later, they shouldn't know what they knew. Like uh, Trisha shouldn't have known that her uh, stepfather was vending a candy bar, you know, um, Hall, hallways away from the surgical room. Um, that is AVP. Um, another case that uh, I love to um, tell is from the University of Virginia, Bruce Grayson, my co-editor. Um, a nurse called him one day, said, we got a patient who just recovered from surgery during which they had um, cardiac arrest, and um, they had an NDE, and you might want to come and interview them. And Bruce is like, okay. So he goes over, he interviews the patient, and indeed, during, as the patient's describing, he's out of his body in the surgical room, and he said he um, at one point saw his surgeon flapping his arms as if trying to fly. And Bruce is like, okay. So Bruce went about interviewing each of the people who'd been in the surgery room individually. And they all said the same thing. When he told them this, you know, the patient reported that Dr. So-and-so was flapping his arms as if trying to fly. Um, the, um, the person would go, Oh, oh, yeah, Dr. So-and-so, yeah, he, uh, he does that. Well, so what happens is, and then in the end, you know, finally Bruce interviewed the doctor himself. He says, oh, yeah, when I scrub in and my hands are sterile, I put them on my chest. I back into the surgery room, and then I'm um, standing there while they're doing all the stuff that they do. And when my part comes, then I take my hands down and I start my part, so I keep my hands from getting contaminated. Well, in this particular case, while he was standing there, the patient went into cardiac arrest. And so he's shouting things, you know, move that thing over there, you know, do this, do that. He's flapping his arms as if trying to fly. So more than anything else, um, there have been attempts to capture NDEs in hospital studies and things like this uh, that have not so far been successful. But um, in my, I went through all the literature I could find, and I could find only 107 cases of veridical perception. 
And so um, it will take a long time in hospital research to be lucky enough to capture one of these um, you know, at, at, the, at the moment. But um, more than anything else, these experiences um, confirm that the experience is real. So um, explanatory models of near-death experiences. Uh, the main point of this chapter is that there are um, two um, categories of explanations. Material, where um, people try to explain the experience in terms of the functioning of the brain, uh, physical processes, and non-material. And what I can say in a nutshell is that any material explanation that's been attempted doesn't account for some of the things that happen in NDEs. So for example, you know, you think, well, there's lack of oxygen to the brain. Well, there's some cases of people who had NDEs just while they were falling in a mountain climbing accident. You know, the fall takes like three seconds, and there wasn't time for them to have lack of oxygen to the brain. Yet while they were in transit, they had a full-blown NDE. So, um, um, and there are theories about endorphins and um, just all these things. And, but the thing is that none of those models can explain how Trisha knew that her stepfather was vending a candy bar. You know, while she was unconscious and flatlined in the surgical room. And so, um, so no material explanation accounts for everything we know about NDEs. And finally, um, the practical applications. Uh, it is um, possible to um, use information about NDEs to help people who are grieving um, and um, to um, use them in educational settings and so forth. So um, Tricia has just one last thing to say to you. Maybe that's my hope, is that I'm telling you know, my story to other people that they don't have to have as dramatic <coughs> as a little awakening. Maybe I can simply be sitting in a class and listening to someone else's story and going, hmm, no, maybe I'm not living the way I should be living. You know, I think I'll, I'll change. And that is it. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I was yeah. trying to get your book while that was on. <laughs> We're done. Oh, really? Okay, so let me mm -hmm. start taking questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes? Uh, in these near death, uh, I mean, in uh, life reviews, uh, uh, is there any uh, evidence to indicate that as people get older, they become more empathetic, I guess, and they start reviewing their all themselves. Mm -hmm. that, that attenuates the severity. Yeah, I'm looking for a loophole here. Of, <laughs> uh, of, of the one when they finally have to fess up uh, yeah. or they don't have to do anything, I guess. But, there actually is research that in particular, um, it, it's kind of like the um, sex stereotypes of women being more empathic, men being more kind of goal-oriented and sort of unempathic, that that tends to, there tends to be convergence as people age. So women become more purposeful, men become more empathic. And I guess the only words of comfort I can say is that um, it, if indeed one becomes more empathic in life and behaves accordingly, then the, you, at least you can know that your life review will get better as it goes along. <laughs> I'm hoping for that. Yeah, I, me I, too. I've got all of them memorized right now. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you know a Diane Corcoran? Yes, uh, Diane is a good friend of mine. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. I just have her on radio show. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, she's a, um, particularly an expert on military near-death experiences because she's a retired um, military colonel. Uh -huh. There seems to be a huge increase now of attempted and successful suicide by returning veterans. Is there anything you can recommend for therapists that you would have learned from people who had had this experience after attempted suicide that would help discourage them from doing it? Yeah, well, and I, I would say this for suicide. Can you repeat the question again, please? 
Yes, thank you. Um, the question is, is, do I have any suggestions for therapists working with military uh, veterans who may be prone to suicide attempts? And there seems to be a, a high rate of suicide among returning veterans. And um, what NDEers say is, and, is, and particularly those whose NDEs occurred uh, with suicide, is, um, well, first of all, let me, let me say this, that in the general population, if this represents the risk for attempting suicide, one of the things we know in the mental health field is that if someone attempts, their likelihood of attempting again goes up. If they attempt and don't succeed, they're likely to try again at a much higher rate than the population at large. But if a person had a near-death experience in their suicide attempt, their likelihood of attempting drops below the um, population at large. And the reason is that they learn in their near-death experience that their life has purpose and that suffering has a psycho-spiritual purpose. And that when someone wants to kill themselves, it probably is because they need to be transformed in some way. And the trans but the transformation doesn't necessarily have to be transforming from physical to non-physical form. It might be a, a revision of their, um, their life and world view. So um, NDEers say it's not that they perceive that they, that they